Welcome everyone to the Border Innovation Challenge. It is my pleasure to introduce the Dean of UC San Diego's Rady School of Management, Lisa Ordonez. Hello, welcome to the second annual Border Innovation Challenge, a program that is a partnership between the Rady School of Management and the Institute of the Global Entrepreneur and sponsored by the Smart Border Coalition, a coalition of business leaders in the San Diego Tijuana border region that's strives to improve travel and trade through the ports of entry between San Diego County and the Tijuana metropolitan area. This year's program was open to students, faculty and staff, and recent alums from colleges and universities along the US-Mexico border who've been working on technologies to tackle issues like border wait times, moving freight across the border, and challenges of border operations in the age of COVID-19. I'd like to thank the Burnham Foundation, Vesta Zintre, for supporting this year's program. In addition, I'd like to thank the teams from the Rady Schools, California Institute for Innovation and Develop Development, and the Institute for the Global Entrepreneur for their work in putting tonight's program together, as well as the team of mentors from the IGE for working with our semifinalists and finalists. Finally, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's MC, Alan Lilienthal. Alan has been living in the binational region since 1998. He was born in Mexico City, raised in San Diego, and now lives in Tijuana. His work is fueled by the unique cultural dynamic that exists when you live between two countries. This is the, he is the host of the Port of Entry, a KPBS podcast about the unexplored subcultures, creativity, and people who are shaped by the U.S.-Mexico border. He is a member of uh, Duolingo, uh, a bi bilingual hip-hop supergroup with members on both sides of the wall. All of his work explores how cross-border co collaboration can be used as a tool for joy and community. Thank you, Alan, for being with us tonight, and it's my pleasure to turn things over to you. Thank you, Dean Ordonez, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, to get started, we are going to welcome Gustavo de la Fuente, who is going to speak to us about tonight's sponsor. Gustavo is the executive director of the Smart Border Coalition, a role he was appointed to in March of 2017. Gustavo focuses on helping to mobilize partners and stakeholders in coalition stakeholders and coalitions designed to achieve specific objectives around border issues. He believes that greater civil society involvement in the binational relationship is critical to the prosperity of our border region, and that in the medium term, our binational region must find different frameworks and ally with new actors to innovate border management and become a model for land ports around the world. Gustavo, welcome. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, and so once again, Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Uh, I'm the executive director of the uh, San Diego Tijuana Smart Border Coalition and um, one of the co-sponsors and supporters of the Border Innovation Challenge. Uh, the coalition and I are committed to this competition, which uh, helps advance our mission, making trade and travel easier between San Diego and Tijuana. I'd like to open by showing you a video of what we do as a coalition. An estimated 112 million crossings happen at the San Diego County, Tijuana Metropolitan Area International Land Ports of Entry. Goods totaling up to $51 billion are transported across the binational boundary. Since 2007, the Smart Border Coalition has been committed to making this travel and trade easier and more efficient. Coalition members have worked together bridging interests across both countries and seeking creative and practical solutions to improve border movement for all eligible travelers. It's an effort that requires a common commitment of purpose, planning, and funding. Our coalition's community is remarkable. Their professional missions extend across a wide array of industries and interests, including tourism, culture, health, retail, manufacturing, diplomacy, trade, real estate, government, education, and more. Over the past 30 years, members of today's coalition have inspired 
and been involved in projects that have brought major innovation to our region's ports of entry. Among those are the Century Program, the recent modernization and expansion of the San Isidro Port of Entry, the opening of the Cross-Border Express, the bridge allowing passengers to access the Tijuana International Airport directly from San Diego, and the opening of the Pedwest Pedestrian Crossing at the El Chaparral Port of Entry. We've achieved these goals through active collaboration with those most affected by the existence of the border. Come join our coalition. Participate in our free, lively, bi-monthly public stakeholder meetings held alternately in the two countries. Connect with our unparalleled network on both sides of the border. We give you a voice to discuss critical border issues, propose frameworks for discussion, and put forward improvements. Become a member and meet some of the most influential and reputable business people and civic leaders on both sides of the border. Over time, our work at the Smart Border Coalition is adding up to major breakthroughs, contributing to achieving our vision of making the San Diego-Tijuana border the most innovative border in the world. Thank you, Gustavo. Thank you for that video. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the work you do. I'd like to, I'd like to share with you, if you can hear, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. I'd like to share uh, with you and the, the group the strategic transcending vision into which the uh, Border Innovation Challenge fits <clears throat> as a very important piece. I am going to quote a, uh, an insightful statement by Michael Malone, who uh, closely studied our region before writing the new book. El Tercer País, San Diego and Tijuana, two countries, two cities, one community. Michael said, and I, I open quote, you have to develop something larger now, something more permanent, something that endures no matter what shocks occur between the two countries. And my sense is that you are moving in that direction slowly, and the Smart Border Coalition may be the source of this, the wellspring of it. But this region you live in is beginning to need supranational or international institutions, things that rise above the unique needs of San Diego and Tijuana, that actually have governance over many activities you both share. At the larger level, there are no overarching major institutions making common decisions for both sides, and it can be done." End quote. In the uh, 1980s and uh, early 1990s, the University of California strengthened its ties to the city of San Diego by encouraging technology transfer with developing companies. This uh, programmatic, truly historic action helped to transform San Diego into a world leader in technology-based industries. I believe our region now has before it an equally historic opportunity to rise to a new level of stature and development by investing in the cross-border relationship. So, as the Smart Border Coalition's representative, I take this moment to challenge our region's uh, institutions of higher learning, our technology companies, our investors, and entrepreneurs. I challenge them to see our border as the next great opportunity for managerial and technological advancement. Our coalition has already started to answer the call by opening a dialogue with UCSD. The purpose of the dialogue is to develop a practical way to identify and provide vital statistics focused on measuring the economic impact of the border, as well as perceptions of impact. This compilation of vital statistics and information presented in a new way would essentially comprise a new service of the Smart Border Coalition. We envision the information could be delivered uh, in two ways. First, in the form of a real-time or frequently updated online dashboard, and second, as an economic uh, report on border impact that can be accessed and used by key stakeholders. We believe this project should lay the groundwork for an advisory group of tech, business, government, and policy experts. Their task would be to find creative ways and frameworks to turn our border into a catalyst for economic development, the likes of which no other border area has ever seen. We often uh, hear about the economic impact of our military, our tourism, and our innovation. The yearly impact of these economic drivers is almost $85 billion in San Diego County alone. Just the innovation economy represents over $15 billion. However, 
it's not often that we hear about the economic impact of, the, of our border. Some have estimated it at a minimum $10 billion each year, yet there's no official number. What is the value of the fact that there were more than 112 million crossings through our ports last year? This exceeds the use of Atlanta Hartsfield Airport, the busiest in the world. What does this San Diego Tijuana connection mean for how we compete globally and how much more value would we create with more streamlined and efficient ports with little or no wait times and undisrupted traffic? No other region along the border between the US and Mexico understands better than San Diego and Tijuana how government works with respect to the border. No other region has the intellectual and monetary assets to transform the way we look at the line that separates and also unites our two countries. These circumstances are a call to act. So are Michael Malone's words a harbinger of things to come? It really depends on us, on you, the binationally immersed community. So returning to today's border innovation challenge, I thank the Rady School of Management and the Jacob School of Engineering for working with us to make the challenge a reality in particular. I'd like to highlight the leadership of Lara Rosojova and her team at the California Institute for Innovation and Development and Dennis Abremsky of the Institute for the Global Entrepreneur. Thank you, Karen Jensen, for keeping us on track. Monique Casellas for your diligence and assertiveness, as well as the mentors for guiding the participants. On behalf of the entire Smart Border Coalition, I also want to express my gratitude to our coalition members, Malin Burnham for the Burnham Foundation, Steve Williams of Sentry, and Lorenzo Barro and Elias Laniado of Vesta for their generous support in getting this second edition off the ground in spite of the pandemic. I urge you to support our mission, making travel and trade easier between San Diego and Tijuana. Increasingly, hands-on civic participation in developing ideas and initiatives to make our international ports of entry smarter can spur governments and agencies to action. Your time and resources are critical to facilitating, catalyzing, and driving change for improving our ports. As you heard in the video I showed, over time, incremental changes to the ports and surrounding areas will add up to major breakthroughs, contributing to achieving our vision of becoming the most innovative border in the world. We appreciate all of you for joining us this evening. May we Take this event as the beginning of a transformative period that will lift our border to the importance it deserves. To those from both sides of the border who sent in their applications, we congratulate you. To our five finalists, we wish you good luck. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gustavo. Uh, thank you for that. I couldn't agree more about the unique opportunities that, that live in this region. I, I sing the same song to whoever will listen. Um, so thank you. Now we're gonna we're gonna meet the judges for tonight's border innovation challenge. First up, we have Sandy Agnos, who is the head of product for Robust AI, an early stage software company working toward the goal of making robots that are smarter, safer, more robust, more context aware, and collaborative. As a product management and business development executive, Sandy has been instrumental in the strategy commercialization and launch of numerous disruptive AI technologies, including three different autonomous mobile robots with three different companies across North America, Europe, South America, and Asia Pacific region since 2011. Welcome, Sandy. Second is Melanie Haggerty, who is the Senior Director of Engineering Applications. She and her team collaborate closely with design engineering, IT engineering, and business leads to determine how best to leverage engineering applications and tools and lean techniques to improve our engineers' experience and speed, robustness of hardware and software development and delivery. Prior to her position, she served as the Vice President of Innovation and Corporate Engineering. Melanie, welcome to the show. All right, third up, we have Kimberly Davis King, who has over 17 years in the venture capital industry and is the co-director for the Rady School's Start, Start Our Accelerator. Kim's focus is on investing and mentoring startups and high growth companies. She is on the oversight committee for Evo Nexus and an advisor to many early stage and growth companies in San Diego, including Clicks, Ira, 
Trials.ai, Philometron, and Verve Wireless. Welcome, Kim. And last but not least, we have Barbara White, who is the CFO for Taylor Guitars in El Cajon. Barbara started at Taylor in 2009 and is an active participant in, national, in the National Association of Music Merchants Advocacy Work. Barbara is on the board of directors for the Regional Economic Development Corporation for San Diego and is a member of the World Trade Center San Diego Global Competitiveness Council. She is also part of the District Export Council Department of Commerce and was a former board member of the San Diego County Water Authority. Welcome, Barbara. And welcome to all of the judges. Okay, I guess we'll meet them soon. <laughs> um, we are going to now move on to the main part of the show. I hope everyone's excited as I am. I'm excited to see how we can improve the efficiency of this border region. Um, we're going to have all the teams present one by one. Just as a reminder to the judges, there will be around time for about two or three questions per team, depending on how long each answer goes. And don't forget to write down your score for each team. This is for the judges, and we'll, which we'll save for the end. Also, as an audience member, if you want to write down your score, there will be a poll at the end where you can also participate in submitting your scores. All right. I hope everyone's excited. Without any further ado, let's start the Border Innovation Challenge 2020. First up, we have Pere, presented by Paloma Santos and Austin Shagley, who are both recent UC San Diego alums with degrees in cognitive science. Good luck to you both and to the Pere team. Uh, before we start the presentation, we just wanted to give uh, a huge thank you to our mentor, Stephen Sivitz, and the ICOR program. Additionally, we'd like to say good evening to all. I hope everyone's doing well today. Um, should I just say when I'm ready to go? You can go ahead. Right. The San Diego border sees thousands of daily crossings, pedestrians, and vehicles, many of whom are daily crossers for work, school, family, or shopping. The boundary complicates the daily lives of crossers, thousands of crossers with unique reasons for traveling. One of those crossers is Miguel, a small business owner from Los Angeles who has a shop in Tijuana and travels across the border multiple times a week. Even after decades of crossing the border, there is seldom a guarantee that the experience of crossing each time will be like the last. He aims to make his journey as quick and uncomplicated as possible. Unfortunately, this is rarely the case, with an average crossing taking up to three hours. This leads to an overwhelming sense of helplessness. Not only does planning, determination, and effort prove useless when crossing, but through the years, it hasn't improved. Miguel just represents one face in the sea of thousands. There are mothers traveling with their children, students trying to get to school, and blue collar workers trying to get to work on time. Although these people may be different in their goal of crossing and their struggles, they're united in their desire for accurate and reliable information about wait time and congestion. With the current system, there is no accuracy, consistency, or transparency regards to information on border traffic. Therefore, Thousands of people compensate for the unknown by getting to the border early to try and guarantee that they'll make it across in time. We're aiming to help people like Miguel, students, blue collar workers and businessmen whose obligations on the other side of the border are compromised due to the uncertainty around border traffic, creating a sense of helplessness and fear for the future. In addition to the personal burden, border traffic has an effect on the economy and the environment. If even half of crossing vehicles at three minutes or less, it would save 150,000 gallons of gas annually. If that's not enough, accurate wait time information would save an estimated $7.2 billion. This is our value proposition. By accurately processing crowdsourced data, our product will reduce uncertainty around wait times and suggest optimal travel times by providing accurate information on border traffic, pedestrians, and flow. The value pair it provides is an improved crosser experience. Through the collaborative effort of all, you just create a better system for all. Hoy por ti, mañana por mi. Now, how big is our market? The US-Mexico border is the busiest border in the world with hundreds of millions of crossings a year, and it's set to rise. Tackling the grand majority of travelers across the US-Mexico border is our long shot goal. 
and we see no reason why para couldn't work in other border states. However, we are focusing in on California and the immediate challenges at the San Ysidro border. In addition to focusing in geographically, we believe that by honing in on people who cross multiple days a week, such as blue collar workers, students, et cetera, it gives us a conservative, a conservative obtainable market range from five to 50% of daily crossers. As you can see, there is a very vocal community around border traffic. We have seen time and again, through secondary research, user comments, and through our own surveys and interviews that people desire accurate border information and are frustrated in not having it. We have seen the direct results of lacking this data. One of our interviewees ended up dropping out of college due to the sporadic border crossing system. There have been numerous apps that have tried to track wait times at the border and have failed. Why you ask? Because all the apps that have attempted to solve the problem solve it the same way, using a flawed CBP data or making makeshift solutions like Facebook. This is where PAIR is different. Our app would be designed ground up to directly address the issues of congestion, traffic, and wait times at the border. That is a key to our success. Crowdsourcing data from our community of contributors and using it to make accurate, reliable, and readily available information for our users. Through the marketing funnel, we see our relationship with our customers following a self-service model due to the nature of our app. Without the users, our solution simply does not work. The customer is truly our lifeline, and we understand that it is of utmost importance that our user receives high quality content and experiences, starting from awareness to interest, to the acquisition and the growth of our application. Utilizing this get, keep, grow model, we deliver just that. Focusing on our get through the marketing funnel, we will spread our awareness through the launch campaign. We are incentivizing users by focusing in on where our population is most heavily concentrated, Facebook, the radio, and physically at the border. Utilizing advertising, advertising marketing strategies will be our biggest leverage in cu customer turnout at the launch of our application. Like any other business, we have goals and resources that must be obtained. However, because our app is entirely dependent on crowdsourced data, I would just like to emphasize how key it is for us to manage and analyze and process our users' data into useful and accurate border information. Now, what does a revenue model look like? Because of our reliance on user-provided data, it is critical to have as many users as possible, and we therefore view a price barrier as directly opposing that idea. As such, we intend on monetizing through advertising, partnership, and affiliate sales. Our app would utilize a two-sided two -sided market, market where the beneficiaries are the users and the pairs would be advertisers, marketers, and those purchasing data who utilize our platform. Where do we go from here? We have defined our problem and are now at our ideation milestone. Our ask is to help us make contact with government managers, CBP agents, and San Diego Tijuana officials to help expand our knowledge of the intricacies at the border. The border is a critical element in the relationship between the US and Mexico. It acts as a door of opportunity. So it's important that it adds to the well being of those crossing. How? By providing accurate and effective information on border traffic, more people are capable of crossing in an organized fashion. This foundation of helping single people in their journey of crossing the border balloons up to eventually, to eventually benefiting and helping the entire economy, society, and environment of the region. An example being, students who cross the border to study not only empower themselves, but this in turn creates further social and economic growth. The social implications of accurate and reliable wait times are evident. It opens more opportunities for those who want a brighter future for themselves and the region. Hoy por ti, mañana por mí. Thank you. Oh, I realized I was muted the whole time. Thank you so that much. <laughs> Thank you, Paloma and Austin, for the presentation. Um, do the judges have any questions that you'd like to ask the team? Uh, this is Sandy. 
Um, do you have a prototype or beta of, of your app or, or um, how the flow would work? We do not yet. We, uh, we have begun kind of toying around with wireframes and such in the beginning stages. And we think that um, the beginning A-B testing for our app would involve using something like Bubble, if you're familiar with that. But um, no, there's nothing official yet. It's basically just toying around. Uh, our background is cognitive science. So we feel that we could flow into it pretty uh, easily. But we haven't really reached that part in uh, our process yet. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, this is Kim. Um, how do Hi, you Kim. measure the social impact? Sorry, what was that? How do we measure the social impact? Yes. Well, I mean, how would we measure the social impact? I mean, through there's very, well, specifically social impact. Sorry, I was thinking about environmental. Well, social impact would be the amount of people that uh, have uh, upward economic mobility, for instance, because they're able to have jobs uh, that are actually accessible across the border. Um, there would be people who, uh, like students, who are able to empower themselves, get better educations, uh, that then in turn they could take back to Mexico or you know, the US, regardless, they're improving the situation for them and others in the border region or uh, wherever they decide to go. So those are the two most obvious ways to me uh, that uh, it would socially impact people. This is Barbara. I'm curious about your source of revenue. Um, have you ex looked at other similar apps and looked at what how they are generating revenue and how successful it might be? Maybe not similar in terms of what it's doing, but in, in its revenue sources. Uh, we've been actually looked at both. Uh, Waze is a big influence on us. Uh, we saw what they were doing with the fact that they're able to map out entire cities. And we were like, why can't this work for you know a single, very specific border region? And uh, they are you know profitable through advertisement. That's where they get a lot of their uh, income from is through advertisements and uh, affiliate sales. And that's something that we're hoping to apply to our app as well, especially since it's so concentrated in a small area. You know, There's uh, hundreds of businesses on both sides of the border that would be very interested in you know, knowing when traffic and flow is gonna be in their area, because that's just naturally gonna lead to more business. And when, and when you talk about subscriptions, what are you thinking in terms of, is that a subscription paid by the user? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we were considering with the idea of freemium, uh, as, as Paloma said, uh, you know, we want as many people to use it as possible. So, you know, inherently by being free, that's going to allow that. But we were thinking that for, say, businesses or, um, you know, people who just happen to want the information, they could pay a subscription fee in order to have data maybe surrounding uh, demographics of the user, you know, uh, consistent travel time of the user and so on. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, this is this is Melanie Haggerty. Um, my question is: is what what is your competitive landscape? I know you had a slide on it, but you know, in general, uh, you know, there are like you're showing competitors that have tried this, and usually they're very successful when the barrier to entry is low and the probability for revenue is really high. Um, what what's the depth of the research that you have done on on the competitive landscape? Uh, well, the depth of the competitive landscape uh, is uh, we haven't been able to, you know, get into the exact finances of any of these companies. We've tried to talk to uh, a few of them to find out what exactly, uh, you know, went wrong, perhaps with their implementation. But currently, uh, the system is this. An app will get released. There's hype around it. And then within, like, say, two months, people are like, oh, this is crap. Don't even bother using it. And people just end up resorting to what we find mainly as being Facebook. So they go on to Facebook, uh, Como Esta La Linea is the name of the page, and they go on there and they talk about, you know, border traffic and, you know, uh, how long did it take you and so on. So there appears to be no very profitable apps or uh, projects in the region at the moment or in the area at the moment. Uh, the main thing is just open and free Facebook. Uh, I hope that answered your question. I'm sorry. Thank you. Any more questions from the judges? No? Great. Thank you so much.
Paloma and Austin. Uh, don't forget, judges, to write down your scores, put them somewhere safe. We'll hold those for the end. All yeah, right. Thank you. Yeah. Next up, we have Smart Border System, and the presenter will be Eduardo Cabrera, a lecturer in engineering and technology at Universidad Autónoma de Baja California. Eduardo, mucha suerte. Good luck. You're, you're muted, Eduardo. Good evening, everyone. As in any project, the one you're about to see is the result of collaboration between many persons. But today, in King, we want to thank Sam Knight, UCIS and Diego Alumni Board Member of Directors for his invaluable contribution to these presentations. Now, let's get right into this. The Smart Border System is an exciting business opportunity for enhancing border crossings, but first, we need to talk about Fronterizos, who are the main focus of the project. A small sample survey held in the last weeks, and which includes all different commuters categories, brings to us the next conclusion. No one likes to wait in line. Our technological solution enables commuters to use their time in such an intelligent way through a digital platform for upfront planning their border crossings. Or rephrasing, it is an open invitation to wait at home at the coffee shop, at the warehouse, or manufacturing plant, or wherever, but do not waste time in line. The challenge of predict and enhance border wait times is our unmet need, and show us that we face a multi-factor problem and dependent of time pass. Fortunately, the variety of civil engineering techniques provide the correct framework to manage this situation. The first step distinguish two main classifications to analyze. Servers in one hand, which includes all the activities that occur in inspection models, and on the other hand, we love the arrival rate to commuting lanes as the demand. This approach is, re is relevant because it differs from other similar proposals that you suggest to combine in beforehand customs processes of two different countries. Instead, in our proposals, you can notice that the server's condition will be kept to use jurisdiction and the demand will be manageable at the Mexican jurisdiction just like it happens now, but in a significantly ordered way from the Mexican side. Then we rethink commutes through the smart border system, which controls dedicated lanes, only accessible with a reserve confirmation with an affordable toll. Our technology managed the arrivals of commuters via time slots. Analyzing the current situation, we observe that central lanes experience much less wait times than the rest lanes types. But this happened just by consequence of a security filter that results in much less demand. Despite this, all different lanes, including Sentry, suffer a wide range of variation in wait times caused by the dynamic nature of arrivals. So what does the smart border offer to this issue? Through instrumented lanes, our system will manage the arrivals uh, the arrival rate in coordination with dynamic control access, optimizing flow to border inspection models. This way, we will be capable to reduce wait times and estimate them with a high level of accuracy. And of course, we will be delivering the intangible value of peace of mind. How does the site intervention seem? Here is a simple perspective of the proximity to a time and support of entry indicating a dedicated road lane, which ends to dedicated inspection models of CVP and the location of the instrumentation that we need. For incomes, we are considering electronic toll-based fees for time slot reservation. 
Then talking about cost structure, we classify them into initial investment per land port of entry, the operation cost of the system, and variable costs so, so, such as marketing, third-party resellers, and uh, others. The engineering approach allows us to consider all the northern traffic as, a, as our total addressable market. On the screen, you visualize the last 10-year average across the border. Then for the serviceable available market, we select the seven busiest land port of entry with more than 4 million personal vehicles crosses per year. We, we think the radio lane commuters are a natural pre-selected market fit. Our near-term goal for an obtainable market share is to reach around 50% of SAN. Socioeconomic studies show us that commuters at least spent around $3 per 30 minutes of wait. This finding is aligned with a, with a SANDAC recent survey that exposed an explicit willingness to pay at all for enhancing border crossings. A conservative extrapolation of this willingness to pay results in an obtainable market of $24 million per year. Analyzing some key values between different solutions at the border, we qualify and order the level of repercussion of different strategies to face the border crossing issue. You can notice that the smart border system has a significant positive impact. Through an integrated technical consultancy, King will provide the queues management principles that will end into a software and system specifications. After that, we will manage the integration of consultants, technological partners, developers, suppliers, third parties, among others. Our firm members and collaborators provide the correct mixture of knowledge and talent in transportation principles and experience at critical mission systems operations to address and handle the technical challenges. Also, we count with O2M2 as a technological partner for system implementation and IT industry knowledge. Speaking of unfeasibilities, we classify them into five main areas. Research and development related to all the front-end and back-end stuff, the integration of activities, experts, etc. All of these based on last long agreements with national authorities, and of course, the, the system daily operation management and support, and a clear and friendly customer relationship through an, through an app and website towards diver, different market segments. We consider agreements as an enabler. The Disneyland Fast Pass service proves us that the project is not only feasible, but also people try to avoid wait any wait times in their theme parks adventure. This way, our experiences and complementary backgrounds allow us to offer active cross-border queues management with relevant implications for USMCA. We can choose now to assume the status quo or introduce technology for border crossings. We need funding, agreements, and engagements. Do you want to join us? Together, we can establish a before and after in border crossings. I'm Eduardo Cabrera, project principal of a smart border system. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Eduardo. Gracias. That was awesome. Um, do the judges have any questions for Eduardo? I have a question. Um, so one of your charts in terms of market size just talked about northbound traffic. So what collaboration do you need to have with the U.S. Um, side in order to accomplish this? Thank you, Kim. The, the contribution from the, the, the U.S. authorities is only related to the dedicated inspection models that, that uh, are still open to, to our dedicated lane in Mexico. That's the only requirement we need. This is Barbara. I have a question. Um, I, I'm very impressed with your presentation. I'm wondering what the approximate investment will be. It looks like it could be fairly expensive. Have you put together some financial analysis on this yet? Thank you for, for your question, Barbara. Yes, we have uh, take further uh, some numbers uh, to, to, to make a budget to, to, to make the proof of concept stage. But it, it, the requirements and specifications co comes from our knowledge and our 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 first guesses. No, we need to need we need feedback from from main stakeholders and investors 
to to full full accomplish all the requirements in in integral way. Thank you. Thanks to you. Eduardo, I, um, what, what is, I think I may have missed it during your presentation, but what is the, the, um, the technology framework? You, you mentioned sensors, you mentioned some other things, but I'm not seeing the, the total picture in terms of how, how does that all fit together? Yes, it, it, well, it depends on, on a, a specific type of, of sensors that call uh, transponders. I know you, you get it. Where, let me let me try to to come back from my from that slide. This is the, this is the transponder, and this is a, a the 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 all the instrumentations that we need inside. The 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 thing here is the the technological system that will uh, manage the control access in a dynamic way, responding to the to the traffic and demand con conditions. So. The technological parties already exist. The, the new thing it's related to the way to manage the Q, the QE. What happens if somebody uh, arrives either before or after their scheduled time? What happens? Well, of course, we were, we were thinking in a, in a tolerance, but it, it will work like the airplane, no? The, the airplanes uh, or, or, or the airports work in, in a way that, that probably it, it could uh, the passengers could could be have a, a a span of tolerance, but after that we will restrict the access and and, and ask for another reservation. This is Sandy. Um, I just had a question. Uh, it's more a competitive question, but have you looked at other countries and other border crossings that have done something similar or different that you know might have some success? I'm just Curious if uh, if you found any other systems that are, work well in other countries. In, in other countries, we, we we don't have made the, the research in an exhaustive way, and if uh, but we are focusing right now here in Tijuana that it's the the most congested uh, border re border region, and uh, of course uh, uh, all our projects and observations are related to this particular site. No, we have not uh, taken any any research to, to other borders. We think it, this is a guess that there is no technology in in land port or land port of entries across the world in particular. Uh, this concept of time slots for queues and and and, and, and customs, uh, it will be a, a, an innovative innovation for for the region and the world probably. Okay, thank you. Thanks to you, Sandy. Great, I think that's all the questions. Thank you to all the judges. Thank you, Eduardo. Well, thanks to you, Alan. And we'll see thanks. you again at the end. Thank all you. right, moving on to the third team. The third team is called Luna Diagnostic, and it will be presented by Yuan Zhui, a postdoc researcher at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. Yuan, are you, I hope you're ready and good luck to you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, and uh, first of all, I want to thank my mentors from IGE, particularly John York for being such a dedicated and talented teacher. And also my personal mentor Stuart for helping uh, us developing the business model. So thank you so much. Um, so I would like to share my screen if... Uh, um, all right, so um, um, let's start. To start with, I wanted to show you this picture. Um, this is a map of showing all the COVID-19 cases at the San Diego County. And you can see that the most infected regions are actually at the border region. And with the majority of people infected from Hispanic origin and from low income families. And on the other side of the border, the city of Tijuana has um, witnessed a surge of COVID-19 cases and has a death toll now surpassed the whole San Diego County. So now this is a big problem. And please meet Gabriel. So Gabriel is the director of a film studio near the San Diego border. Um, so since the outbreak of the uh, pandemic, 
he has been working tirelessly to implement COVID-19 screening procedures in his business. So the film industry is high risk business because there's always people coming um, from and out to the border. And there's a frequent social interaction during a 12 hour, 12 hour day working time. And there's no mask during acting. So what Gabriel does is he spring everybody in his company, 2000, 200 people every week and wait for 24 hours. And for one production cycle, he would do 2000 tests and spend $200,000 on it. And um, uh, the testing has been proven to be useful because there's 10% of employee caught to be infected in the first screening. So to solve a problem for Gabriel, we come up with this COVID detection biosensor. So this is um, um, basically sensors that can be mass produced on paper or plastic. And we modify the surface of it with nanotechnology so that um, viral particles can be detected and translated into electric signal. And that can be wirelessly transmitted onto your mobile phone or computers. So um, our value proposition is, this is a very sensitive test. So this can detect minutes of viral particles in asymptomatic population. And we aim to get a five minutes detection time. So this allows Gabriel to make a decision on the spot. And we want to make this test affordable for economically underprivileged area like Mexico. And we also wanted to make it suitable for large screens. So um, what is our market? And just the film industry alone, uh, there's a half a million employees in the US and Mexico film industry. And if we assume 10% of them are coming from large studios require regular screening, we're looking at a $250 million per year. And there's a, a about a dozen large production in Baja California that translate into a $5 million market per year. And our other customers are universities, schools, and daycares. So in UCSD, there's a 35,000 students right now doing biweekly screening. Um, so this is also a large market. On top of this, there are 3,000 Maricadora companies along the border with 1 million employees. So the opportunity is big. So who are our competitors? Uh, the current golden standard of testing is called PCR and it's done by most clinical labs. And this is a very accurate test. However, the turnaround time is long because you need to transport the samples to a fully equipped lab and do the whole lab report. And the retail price is also high. And other companies like Quidel, Abbott, and BD come up with a rapid point of care test, uh, antigen test. And this is a relatively cheap, but it struggle with false negatives and also other problems. It cannot detect from asymptomatic people. Um, so what we're trying to see, there's an urgent need for a reliable point of care test for large screens. So uh, we wanted to aim for no false negative results and uh, adapt our screen to screen for large populations. Um, how do we make money? So uh, we wanted to pro provide a service only model for small, uh, for big businesses and schools. So this is a monthly prescription model and um, uh, we will drive our devices and uh, biosensors to the employee and we'll do on-site screening and provide weekly screening and we handle all the logistics. And to make this affordable, we also offer a massive discount at the US-Mexico border region. And on the other hand, we want to offer a personalized device for business executives like Gabriel or Elon Musk, and they can be able to test themselves as frequent as they want, and we provide them with a, a sensor strips. And we also want to make this affordable for low income and first line workers. Um, so this is our roadmap to market. Uh, currently, we're doing the research development and validation in the lab, and we're in partnership with Salk, UCSD, and Sanford Burnham. And uh, we're also in conversation with uh, regulatory agencies like FDA and Mexico's Copper Ferris. And after we gain regulatory approval, we'll enter manufacturing, and we want to contract with Mexico 
manufacturers for uh, producing our device and make the biosensors at our headquarter in San Diego. So um, to distribute our device, we will do an online marketplace or direct sell on our website. And we will sell our biosensors through uh, partners such as Amazon and CVS and also on our own website. So our team consists of scientists from top universities like Salk, UCSD, and we also have experts in um, market access as well as clinical uh, molecular diagnostic in Mexico and business management. Um, so we already built a very close relationship with the Baja Film Ministry and we will rely on the referral from Gabriel and other industry leaders to reach other bigger customers like Baja Studios. We have support from leading hospitals such as Sharps Healthcare and uh, we're talking to private schools such as Francis Parker School and we will get recommendation from clinical virologists and provide excellent customer support and training to keep our customer happy. So hopefully with the new vaccine, uh, the pandemic is coming to an end. Um, after the pandemic, what do we do to keep ourselves relevant? So this is our plan is to make this personalized device for future infectious diseases. With one device, you can do multiple tests and we will customize our biosensors and be able to provide also antibody tests to test for a viral titer, uh, antibody titers. So uh, please join our mission um, to ensure work safety and bring students back to school and protect our frontline workers. And together we can make the border a healthy and safe place for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yuan. Thank you. I'm gonna open it up to the judges for any questions for Yuan. Hi, Yuan. This is Sandy. Nice job. Um, and uh, I started writing down questions, and what I liked is you answered them as I went through. I had two questions. One is: Is this a saliva test? What is the biological matter that you're collecting? So uh, we were so right now we're testing with non-clinical samples, just the viral proteins. But then we will soon move on to test clinical samples like the nasal swab and also saliva. So okay. saliva will be a much better and preferable choice. Typically for kids, they really don't like nasal swab. Sure. The second question I had is, I know you're in the validation stage. Um, are you also validating some of these other disease states and pathogens as well if, while you're validating for, um, for COVID? I mean, is your plan to have validation with multiple diseases before you launch? Um, no, currently we're focusing on COVID because uh, as we talk to the film industry leaders, they really need this right now. And yesterday I was in their film festival and people are really wanting us to make this happen for them. So definitely COVID first and then uh, the others. Okay. But so there's a plan to roll out to other diseases. I, I guess time to market, since there is such a need and you're trying to beat uh, and be impactful now before uh, the vaccine comes out, uh, how quickly do you think you can get to market? Well, yeah, so our current plan is a conservative estimate. Uh, so we are really trying to push through and to like make the, um, FDA approval and uh, Mexico approval in the next quarter. And then after that, the production cycle will be the second quarter and then try to go to the market in the third quarter next year. Um, that's our hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. This is Barbara. Um, I think this is amazing. Of course, we would all love this today. Absolutely. I'm curious, um, when I looked at the slide that showed the relative accuracy to the different competitive tests, what is the, it just gave like some pluses. Um, what is your target accuracy that you're aiming for right there? Um, right, so I think that's a very interesting question. So the golden standard PCR, it's, a, it's super sensitive 
And do we really need to beat the PCR? <laughs> Probably not. So right. the, the gap of the market is, is really like, how do we make a better antigen and more reliable antigen test and rapid antigen test? Um, so maybe something not as sensitive as PCR, but much better than the current antigen test. So what would you say as a, as a percentage that you're looking at as for the accuracy? Like, is it 85 or 90 or? Yeah, so these numbers are uh, very nuanced. Uh, so because uh, right now when we look at for FDA approval and the validation is only with uh, 30 samples or like less than 100 sample clinical samples. So we can get those numbers, but do they really represent the real number? It's, it's, a, it's a matter of question. So we do want to, um, so, so we do want to make it very accurate for asymptomatic people because that's something nobody can claim uh, right now for the antigen test. Mm -hmm. What would you think you would be needed to see? What level of accuracy would you feel like would be meaningful for asymptomatic folks to, for it to be commercially viable? Right, so um, to gain FDA approval is definitely like over 95 or 98% for symptomatic people. For asymptomatic people, I don't know if there's a current uh, regulation on that, but we will try to do get to over 95%. All right, thank you. No other questions. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, time for one more question. Two questions. Okay, so fast I go. <laughs> So the first question, um, on your competitive chart, you had the retail price, but how would your costs compare with your other competitors? Uh, sure, I can share that again. Um, so. You had retail price, but what about, what's the cost for you to make it compared to the right. other? Yeah, so um, we will try to make it as low as $5 if possible. Um, so we're not trying to keep the profit very high because we wanted to make it affordable for the border region. Um, but because this is a technology, we can like mass produce on paper or plastic and we basically print the sensors and do modification on them so we can keep the price pretty low. So yeah, so the sensor itself without modification can be as low as a dollar or less. So after the modification and and it's, it should be, we want to keep it less than $5. And then we will make the device and the electronics doesn't cost a lot of money, so. And then what is the technology that would uh, allow for the asymptomatic testing to be accurate enough? So it's a matter of sensitivity. Um, so compare with the normal antigen test, uh, uh, we're using a kind of electronic de device to read out the, um, the changes in, in electric current. So these can be very little and we can already detect them with the electronic device very well. So with a normal antigen test, uh, it's basically antibody on a piece of paper and <laughs> generating um, signals. So that is a way, way, way more less sensitive technology. Thank you. Yeah. Fortunately, we have to go to the next team that went a little longer to make sure we're on time. Thank you so much, Yuan. Thank you to all the judges for the questions. That was lovely. Um, the next, we have two more teams coming up. The next team is Tijuana Solar River, presented by René Peralta, Herb Green Teaching Fellow for the Christopher C. Gibbs College of Architecture at the University of Oklahoma. René, welcome and good Thank luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, and uh, is my sound okay? Yes. And the image is on the screen, correct? Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Well, first of all, um, I want to thank. Um, uh, Dennis Sabransky, John Jork from IG, and of course, uh, my mentor really um, helped uh, to teach this architect uh, new tricks, uh, Justin Wells. So um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, all of them. 
Um, my company name is Generica and it's interested in uh, new and integral project management models for future cross-border urban projects. And one of our largest projects is the recovery of the Tijuana River Canal. Uh, and, and this is an example of uh, renewable energy and economic recovery for the benefit of our business partners, city government, and most importantly, the citizens of this border region. The Tijuana Solo River project mission is to change lives, create jobs, and hear and heal our ecosystem. When I was growing up in Tijuana, I remember the difficulty my father had in crossing the riverbank to take us to visit my family members on the north side of the city. Um, then in the 1970s, the federal government, the Mexican federal government, built the Tijuana River Canal, which was the largest federal urban infrastructure of its time. It saved many lives during the flooding uh, season and also brought economic growth to the city. The canal not only connected families, but it saved countless of lives from the strong uh, flood currents. According to Manuel, a real estate businessman who grew up near the river, he says the canal is the largest funded work of engineering the city has ever had. It was more than a channel. It included a new business zone that opened the door to international investment. And this is when we say Tijuana sort of became a modern city. Today, uh, due to climate change and lack of investment, the Tijuana River Channel began to turn into a sort of forsaken ditch. 1.5 million uh, Tijuanenses want a new vision for the canal, one that is safe, clean, and provides economic benefit, as it once did when my father saw it being built. Uh, Edgar, a young urban planner for the city, feels that the channel's design was lost, is a lost opportunity to incorporate public spaces, bicycle paths, and other amenities for the thousands uh, of, of citizens living uh, near the canal. And this is the picture of its state uh, today. According to many interviews, we realized uh, that included planners, residents, and business people of the city they all beg for an innovation solution, which consists of multiple players. Uh, and we realized that the city can't do, enough, can't do it anymore alone. The approach to revitalize the canal needs the federal government, the private public partnership, and most importantly, the community. Our solution is a three tier solution that includes a solar farm, the integration of recreational activities, and the cleaning of the water that runs through the canal channel every day. A particular component of the project is to clean that daily runoff from the canal with a biotreatment uh, system with microalgae because of the photosynthetic capabilities they have as they are able to remove CO2 as well from the air. And this is a project that we were working with uh, Dominic Mandola at Scripps uh, Institution. The project has appeared in many international news sources, describing it as an innovative solution that could work for other cities such as Los Angeles and its river. In 2016, the Tijuana River was adopted by a candidate for major, for Tijuana mayor, Gaston Lupton. And one of our project consultants, again, Dr. Dominic Nicola, wrote in an LA article uh, that dedicated to this project that a project of this nature would have far reaching effects on the US side of the border, too, especially in the world of research and education. And we've uh, had other press for this project uh, in also the architecture and the urbanism fields. What is our value proposition for this project? The Solar River could bring value to developers, municipalities, and the everyday border citizen. The Solar River can, be a, can, be a, can appeal for greater investment in public and private projects. Our aim is to design a project combining profit and sustainability across borders. Our research extends to government, engineer, and design communities. 
our reputation expands uh, into academic publications and research and financial design work for cross-border studies. Uh, our key resources are community groups, solar energy consultants, political liaisons, and reputation that we have. Our competition is large companies like Sempra, uh, uh, the federal electrical company, the state of Baja California, and of course the city of Baja California, which do a lot of great uh, infrastructure for this for the region, but many of them lack the social and environmental conscious uh, project. Many of our partners in other projects that we've done is have included Hyperloop One, Hyperloop Technologies, the city of Tijuana, and many other cities uh, where we have worked with them in projects of transportation and other infrastructure uh, ideas uh, that leads to uh, projects that have not only uh, a private uh, uh, a private effort, but also a social and public effort. And what is the next step for the solar river? Well, we need to do uh, three kind of main things. We need to continue to design to identify the zones of the area that we're going to basically put the solar panels on the river canal, uh, analyze the construction issues of putting a solar farm on top of the canal. And of course, the output estimates and the linkages that we need with other institutions in order to this, for this to happen. We've already been sort of approached by a company uh, who is interested in, in renewable projects because this project does not require land. It's already, uh, it could already be on a, ch a channel that is existing. So, so my team and I are going to transform the canal and change the lives of the citizens of the Tijuana San Diego border region. We want to keep this, we want to keep this environmental crisis from getting worse. Uh, so our call is, we're interested in the, the, the involved with people and organizations such as the North American Development Bank, Smart Portal Coalition, of course, City of Imperial Beach, Nawa, CFAA, of course, companies like Sempra. So if this is something uh, that you're interested in, to create a new vision for sustainable cross-border infrastructure for future generations, please uh, contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rene. I really hope this gets down to the River Canal. Uh, judges, any questions for Rene? Uh, Rene, I, I, other than the, um, certainly I, I heard you, your, um, your plea for renewable energy and for environmental um, justice, but I, I guess what what would be in it necessarily for the businesses on either side of the border? Why why do they want to invest in this project? Because this is a huge infrastructure project, you know. So when and when do you think they would see the return on their investment? Right, that's a great question. Well, the uh, what could make this project happen is a um, a contract with the city so that they would be able to buy the power generated by um, the, uh, the solar farm. Um, and uh, uh, that is sort of the, uh, I would think one of the most difficult things, but it, it's not uh, impossible. Uh, and projects like these, uh, uh, solar projects and energy projects usually take a little bit longer than uh, other investments. I would say maybe 10 to 15 years uh, because of sort of um, the amount of course of uh, uh, money you have to put into them. But I think at the end, this is, uh, this is about of course making a profit, but also it's about making our, our region more sustainable. A uh, project like this can actually produce energy for about 146,000 homes in Tijuana. So uh, I think, uh, but yes, it will take a little bit more time uh, in order to uh, uh, a company have its, uh, you know, uh, their return. What are all of the, have you, I don't know what the, 
not familiar with even the permitting or regulation process. Is there any of that, any, any barriers and, and how are you all, um, are you already looking into that to make this so that it's a, you know, it doesn't get mired in political or, or regulatory, you know, uh, roadblock. Right. Yeah. And that's, I think, where we need um, uh, some of the partners in order to uh, be able to go over those roadblocks. Um, but it's not that difficult. The canal is administered by Konawa, which is the national water um, uh, company of Mexico. And they would lease the canal to a company to actually uh, create the solar farm. Now the canal will still work as a canal. It would still be a, uh, a flood channel, but it would have a light structure with the panels on top. So it won't destroy or affect the canal at all. And that's one of the entities. Uh, that we look. The other entity would be um, uh, the uh, CFAA, which is the uh, National uh, Electric Company uh, that we can tap into so that we can tap into the grid uh, for the different communities that are around this, um, uh, this project. But as you can see in this picture, expands practically the whole city. This is Barbara. I've got a couple of questions. One, how, um, how proven is the microbiology uh, or the, the organism cleanup? Um, I forget what it was called on the slide, but the way the Tijuana River would actually be cleaned up and the water cleaned, how, how effective and proven is that? Yes, that's a great question. And since we began this project, we've seen the technology grow. Um, there are, um, if you, in this uh, picture, if you see there's a little channel in the middle of the whole uh, canal, and that is a little stream of water that is basically uh, going all the way to the Pacific Ocean and crosses sometimes closing of the borders on both uh, the beaches on both sides of the border. Now, if we could take that water and uh, first of all, re uh, clean it in a small compound with the algae, we could probably work around 3,000 to 4,000 liters a day. And that's been proven. There are already uh, plants that work in that capacity uh, all over the world. Right? So there's some in England, there's some in the United States. Um, and of course, UCSD is also. Uh, has uh, worked on that, um, modifying the uh, algae in order to be much more productive. So the technology is there and I think we could do it. Uh, we could develop a prototype um, uh, to, uh, to, to later bring it into the market. How, how long do you think it would take to develop that prototype? Well, uh, for about 3,000, uh, liters a day, we would need, we wouldn't need a big area because these are pools. Uh, the algae needs, uh, where of course, uh, the sun and they need to rest on pools. But we're talking about a, uh, maybe uh, a 5,000 to 10,000 square foot area where we can actually produce this. So uh, that uh, getting the land, uh, it's not difficult. It's not a very big area. So I think um, if we have funding for something like this, you know, it, it could practically be done in, in about a year. Okay, thank you. One other question. This is obviously a huge project throughout the whole, um, the, the entire length of the river. However, is it possible to break this into like a small commercial section where maybe businesses on both sides of the border are able to get the energy for it and and maybe there's a, a small section cleaned up and a small section created in solar to kind of prove concept. Have you considered doing it in a small group, in a small section like that? Yes, that is a great idea. And that's something that uh, we've been thinking about as well. Um, if you look at the image uh, for now, uh, the panels they are not all connected because there are a series of uh, bridges 
uh, and other infrastructure of the cross. So these are small little farms kind of that go along the river and those can then be dedicated to certain areas. So as you move towards the east, uh, the river goes into the manufacturing plants. And so that power could be used for the manufacturing plants as well. But yes, that's uh, something that can happen. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Hi, Renee, this is uh, Sandy. I, I really like your vision. I love the repurposing, in fact, multi-purposing. Um, the only question I have is about glare and reflection for airplanes or even nearby housing. Uh, what would the impact be uh, if we were to look a little bit broader? Yes, um, I, I think it would be minimal because there are um, glare and reflection issues with other types of solar uh, plants, ones that concentrate basically um, rays of sun into a central core. And those are really very different. They, 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 even those areas around that get very hot and, and so birds might even get damaged, but not these. These don't really uh, have a lot of glare. I think we, our, our rendering here is was just as a, we put some glare on it so that we can show where they were. Uh, but a lot of the panels are, are very dark and so they won't really actually uh, produce that glare as there are, are the other systems um, that are different from this, which actually work in the desert or in, away from urban areas. And that's what I was uh, thinking about. Thank you, I appreciate yeah. the answer. Thank you so much to all the judges. Thank you, Renee. Thank you. Good luck to you. Um, we have one more team before we move on to the winners. The final team is called Trace Links, will be presented by Guillermo Mejia, an alum of the Universidad Iberoamericana del Norte, and Antonio Huerta, a computer science student at the Instituto Tecnológico de Tijuana. Good luck to you both. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So thanks for allowing me uh, your time to talk about Tracelink, our blockchain for the supply chain. So as you may know um, uh, that uh, and since 2012, food recalls in the US have grown 300%. Uh, each recall is estimated to cost, to cost the producer about $10 million. That's, not, that's their cost without including litigations or liability costs, but that's not the worst part. The worst part is that actually uh, uh, they tend to lose about half percent, half of their uh, customer base due to recall issues. Now, um, if I could have this next slide. Uh, the, sorry, I, I lost my track. Um, over the U.S. imports twenty percent of all food products uh, from uh, from uh, two hundred countries. Most of them are either Mexico, Chile, uh, France, and and. Uh, in China, it, that includes 70% 70, 70 of all produce and a third of all, uh, uh, sorry, a third of all produce and 70% of all seafood uh, products that comes from, um, from those countries. Now, uh, in 2011, the FDA, uh, the FDA approved the Food Modernization Act that allows, uh, that allows, uh, that keeps track of food traceability, not only from the producer side, but also uh, those who manage, uh, those who uh, trans, uh, uh, produce food, those who handle food, and even those who transport and import food. So um, within that uh, traceability, uh, the, it's based on the GS1 standard, which the GS1 standard uh, uh, establish uh, that we can keep track of critical tracking data and key data elements. That keeps track within the, the, the production facility, but also keeps track uh, outside, uh, outside during the whole uh, blockchain, um, uh, supply chain, sorry, supply chain track. So Tracelinks actually the, does the tracking uh, both outside of the production facilities by, by keeping track of those key uh, tracking, uh, critical tracking elements and key data elements. 
So on the next slide, you should see as you go, as the product goes within the different supply chain, uh, and each uh, a transaction is being kept between one or uh, one element of the supply chain, we can uh, register each critical tracking element and key data element. And as it goes further within the supply chain, we can uh, we can also keep track of individual individual transactions as we go within the supply chain. Now, uh, each actor in the supply chain, what we do is we return it into a node as a blockchain, allowing us to keep every track secure, safely secure in the blockchain, but also allowing us to generate uh, smart contracts within each transaction, allowing individuals to keep certain conditions where, uh, as apart from the rest of the supply chain in terms, so you can have like late fees or special bonuses uh, without really impacting the rest of the supply chain. In a larger sense, that same, that same supply chain becomes a, a permission blockchain that we can use to keep track all through the supply chain. Now, some of those actors will probably use Tracelink's uh, SaaS platform to keep track of those transactions, but some, uh, even especially large retailers and other uh, actors may have their own systems, either built in Oracle or SAP, or some other large manufacturing, uh, some other large database or program, we are offering them a Tracelink API, blockchain API that will help them to integrate to their existing platforms. This without the need to further development or without really learning uh, blockchain and thus allowing them to track each transaction in a secure blockchain element, but also allow them to keep smart contracts uh, as each transaction with their own suppliers. Now, uh, Mexico uh, is the second largest producer of uh, importer of, of produce in, uh, to the US. Uh, produce represents 28 billion uh, US dollars in 2019. And, uh, just another reference is that uh, the automotive industry, uh, exports of automotive industry comes to $101 billion and optical and medical also go in into uh, uh, $16 billion in 2019. Now, uh, what, we're, uh, what our, our uh, market is, we're targeting, we're targeting a, a, a subscription of $3,000 annually for each subscription. There's over three, 300 um, um, companies that export directly to the US. Our goal is by year three to have 500 companies already in uh, using our, our software, which gives us a current uh, valuation of, of 2.5 million uh, pre-Mali valuation. Now, we already have since 2014, 15 companies using a trace link to track their products through the US. Okay, so the next one is that um, our, our go-to-market go to strategy is that we focus uh, Half, uh, half of it will be on companies that already export directly to the US. Uh, another third will be focused on companies that export on behalf of smaller producers. And the rest, the small part will be of companies who do not export, but still need a traceability services. And as, uh, as, a, as the next step for future growth, we envision that in the second quarter of 2021, we will move into pharma. Either you're a, a, a lab or a manufacturer that you can uh, that you uh, you can track your medicine or device all through the supply chain, not only to the retail but also to the uh, to your final um, healthcare provider. That's ensuring that there's no blood market supplies being delivered, and that your vaccine or medicine will arrive to the final destination of the people who need it. So um, uh, our, finally, our team is built of uh, uh, Juan de Dios Ledesma, uh, our CEO, Antonio Huerta, our blockchain ex expert, and yours truly, Guillermo, I'm a, the head of product. And I would like to take this opportunity to take Rachel Castello, our mentor for, uh, for this challenge, all the help and, 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 and advice that she gave us. So uh, this is Tracelink, our blockchain to the supply chain. 
and now I'll take your questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Guillermo. All right, judges. Any questions for Guillermo? Hi, Guillermo. This is Sandy. Um, I'm very fascinated by blockchain, and I like that you're using ex existing technology. Um, it seems though you need everybody to agree to it in the entire supply chain. So how or what is your go to market strategy and plan uh, and, and starting with the industry that you're in right now to make sure that everyone along the way buys into it? I will allow uh, Juan or uh, Antonio to speak, but just be briefly. We don't need the whole supply chain to become part of the tracking. If we have two, three elements, those will uh, those transactions will just record them and and will validate them. And once that transaction moves to another uh, element, uh, they will become again part of the, uh, of this network. So we can grow as as long as we can have uh, other uh, actors participate in the blockchain. And they can use trace links or they can use their 16 software with their API to connect and keep track. And it's all done on Hyperledger with an open source blockchain and network. Okay, thank you. This is Barbara. I'm curious about your competitors and existing technologies, whether it's using blockchain or others that are out there in the marketplace already. Uh, that's an interesting question. So uh, GS1, which is the standard that the FDA established in the Food Modernization Act, uh, is, uh, wrote a paper in January 2019 establishing rules for using blockchain to keep track of pr produce. We already uh, integrated those instructions into our system. Now, uh, there are uh, a lot of companies who do full traceability. A, f a few of them are coming on market on board doing blockchain, uh, but there's three types of blockchain. There's a uh, uh, private blockchain, which the first, the largest company is offering a private blockchain. We are using a permission blockchain, which is like a shareable blockchain with uh, other systems. And there's a non-permission blockchain, the, the type. So uh, we have that advantage because we're using a permission blockchain, which is we can keep control of all the elements within the blockchain, but also be flexible enough to add other services within that uh, system. Thank you. Hi, this is Kim. I have one question. So you mentioned you started in 2014. Were you using blockchain back then? And then how many customers have been in the last year? So uh, full disclosure, we started in 2007. Uh, the, 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 the project was presented in Silicon Valley and we actually get, got some uh, investors in that time. That was uh, in hopes of actually taking advantage of FDA uh, approval. Uh, in 2011, the investors um, sort of uh, got um, uh, not interested anymore in the project. And so the IP returned to to Juan Ledesma, who was the original uh, 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 creator. It was not built on blockchain. It was a proprietary system, uh, a SaaS system. Uh, but as, as the years went on and further regulation came on board, we saw a lot of interest spike from especially uh, exporters in Mexico to use a similar system. So we re retook that project in 2014 and actually do it some customer validation with under this new circumstances. And we saw with uh, interest in 2018, the uh, possibilities of blockchain and smart contracts. So in late 18 and last year and this year, we've been migrating this platform to blockchain. The full blockchain uh, system will be uh, delivered by the end of this year. So the, in this, this month uh, and uh, and hoping to take advantage of this new opportunity. So blockchain is just uh, currently, it's already been uh, tested and we probably will release it to our first uh, alpha testers by the beginning of next year. Thank you. Any other questions? Awesome, thank you Guillermo and the Tracelink team. Thanks. That is all the teams presentations. I hope everyone took notes. Now would be the time for all the judges to I think someone's not muted that should be muted.
There we go. Okay. All the judges, please submit your scores. You were giving instructions how to do that. For the audience, there is a poll that's going to be opening up somewhere around here where you can also cast your vote and participate. I hope you choose wisely because this could be a big boost to any one of these teams and definitely a boost of confidence as they work through all the inevitable challenges of working in the border space. So submit your vote now. There's the poll right there. In the meantime, while y'all pick your favorite, we are going to hear from Cheslav Versky, who is the CTO and co-founder of Curbside Labs and the winner of the inaugural Border Innovation Challenge in 2019. Cheslav is a proud alumni of Muir College at UCSD. He built his career by working in the biotech and high-tech industries, as well as being active in the entrepreneurial circles, both locally and in the Bay Area. Cheslav's interested in pursuing projects that impact San Diego Metro and the larger bi-regional community, which led to a development of the winning concept for improving border wait times presented last year. Here is Cheslav. Greetings, everyone. My name is Cheslav Versky, and I'm a CTO and co-founder of Curbside Labs. Uh, first off, I want to say that I'm very grateful and excited to be back at the Border Innovation Challenge this year to share with you an update uh, as to what we've been doing since uh, actually winning the inaugural competition last year. Uh, I think that uh, everyone who has uh, you know, uh, been through the competition up to this point really deserve to be here. I've, uh, I've been able to review some of the submissions uh, for today's competition. And I think that everyone uh, who's made it to the finals definitely deserve to be here and uh, we'll come away learning something uh, important, interesting, and uh, not only about uh, uh, the ideas of others, but also uh, from the, you know, the format of the competition itself. I think it's very important not only be, be able to come up with ideas or the products, but also be able to effectively express them. And uh, we certainly have, uh, I've done that, uh, and uh, you know, it didn't uh, it didn't hurt us to to win the competition itself. It's great to be the winner. Uh, not to say that uh, you know the simple participation uh, you know has its rewards and values. I think the biggest benefit we derived uh, was the fact that uh, uh, this event generates a great deal of uh, exposure and uh, media coverage. There were multiple reports uh, uh, that ended up being produced uh, as a result of our win, uh, both in the United States as well as uh, abroad in Mexico. Uh, partly because uh, the the issues that are being raised uh, and discussed uh, during the Border Innovation Challenge are important to uh, both uh, of our regions. Um, north and south of the border. And uh, uh, the, ex the exposure that, uh, that uh, was the result of, uh, of those media reports was is that uh, we have uh, been able to meet with a number of, uh, of potential investors uh, over, I think, the summer month of last year. And uh, even though uh, we did not get an, uh, a direct uh, investment, uh, we have been able to convert um, some of those discussions into uh, basically revenue streams, you know, project-based revenue streams that uh, uh, sustain us up until moment, um, up until this this time, and uh, and I think will allow us to you know move forward. Uh, so it was extremely valuable. Uh, we do have to thank uh, a lot of folks at uh, the Global or, or the Institute of the Global Entrepreneur and at the Jacob School of Engineering. That's one of the co-sponsors for this event, uh, and being instrumental in providing us uh, with many of those connections, uh, investor connections, and as well as providing uh, additional mentorship and guidance, uh, which I believe they will probably offer and will do for many of the today's participants. Uh, now, the other thing that happened is that uh, we formed a very strong and, in my opinion, invaluable bond uh, with uh, another 
competition co-sponsor, uh, Smart Border Coalition, and uh, specifically with its executive director, Mr. Gustavo de la Fuentes, um, who um, ended up working with us on the multiple fronts, both strategic as well as tactical, uh, in order to present uh, our vision and, uh, and a possible solution to a number of, um, <clears throat> of civic leaders uh, that are, are usually instrumental in being able to, to put a lot of them in place. Uh, so we've been able to present to multiple San Diego City Council uh, uh, members, as well as both commanding officers of the San Isidro and Otamisa border crossing stations. Uh, we've also explored uh, uh, the proof of concept demo uh, by, uh, by surveying, uh, identifying uh, various suitable placement sites for the installation of our uh, camera equipment on both sides of the border. And, uh, and working through various you know, real estate and uh, legal issues associated with that. Uh, as we were just about to start uh, the proof of concept, uh, we have unfortunately been uh, greatly impacted by, uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, as, uh, as our solutions approach you know, relied heavily on, the, on some aspects of uh, facial recognition technology. And, uh, with a, as you know, with near universal mandate uh, for mask wearing, and we had to, you know, to quickly figure out a way to pivot and to remain afloat. And uh, we've been able to do that by uh, splitting our efforts uh, basically in two separate directions. Um, one of them pursues uh, uh, this idea of um, of, uh, of dealing with uh, with various you know, building security and liability you know, issues. Uh, that uh, come with tracking you know, people in and out uh, of the buildings during the regular and off hours, uh, which has come to uh, to be more significant now that uh, you know, access to a number of buildings is, is being controlled and, and, uh, and lots of regions are being care quarantined. And the other one, which is uh, in fact been uh, quite promising and we've been doing a lot of development in that direction, uh, is addressing the need to adequately identify and monitor people that take various certification tests uh, at home. As you know, um, uh, you know things like uh, college board exams, uh, as well as various uh, you know, professional certifications have, uh, have gone virtual. And, uh, and the testing industry has, uh, has had some struggles, actually quite significant number of struggles, in uh, dealing with the fact that uh, every person that takes the test at home has to be continuously monitored. Uh, you know, once again, our technology does use certain aspects of uh, facial recognition and, uh, and uh, the mask wearing mandate does not apply at home. In fact, uh, you have to establish identification as well as to track you know, kind of what's going on in the surrounding environment uh, and uh, it's quite impractical to utilize, uh, you know, a single person, uh, you know, to, to basically track one or even uh, multiple people uh, that have to be taking the tests as those tests number in uh, hundreds of thousands. Uh, so our technology uh, uh, is basically being pivoted in order to, uh, to be able to auto monitor uh, people that are taking those tests. Uh, so that's a very promising direction that we're pursuing at this point of time. And I think it's going to yield uh, great results until, of course, uh, <clears throat> everyone eventually gets vaccinated and we go back to, you know, the old normal. And, uh, and we can once again return to uh, trying to improve wait times at the, at the border as we originally intended. Um, so uh, that's our current update. Uh, or virtual update and uh, I want to conclude by saying that uh, I would love to hear from uh, any of the today's participants or viewers um, to uh, you know, share my experience and um, uh, participating in a competition uh, or to simply discuss their ideas or or just to you know to, to talk uh, after all we're here to you know to network even if virtually and, uh, and the idea is to connect and to come up with new ideas together. I think this is what the Border Challenge ultimately is. 
and, uh, and what's its best purpose for. So um, it looks like uh, I'm standing between <coughs> uh, the conclusion of the competition and the announcement of the judges' decision. So I'm going to get out of the way. Thank you, everyone, and good luck. Great. Thank you, Cheslav. Now we are going to get to the part that you've probably all been waiting for. Announcing the winners. There will be three winners. The audience choice, the runner-up, and the grand prize winner. And there's nothing to wait for anymore. Let's do this thing. In For the audience choice award which comes at $2,000. The winner of the audience choice is the Tijuana Solar River. I might be the only person you hear clapping, but I'm doing it with my whole heart. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Felicidades. Congratulations. Gracias. The runner-up award for $3,500 today will go to the smart border system. Woo! Felicidades. Congratulations. And lastly, the big kahuna, the big prize for $7,000. The winner of today's Border Innovation Challenge 2020 is Luna Diagnostic. Congratulations to Luna Diagnostic. That is all the winners for today. Congratulations to all the finalists who made it this far and to all of the judges. Thank you so much for helping us choose these winners and hopefully improve some kind of efficiency in our border region. I know a lot of people will be very grateful, especially those of us who have to cross the border every day. Anything, anything at all to make the wait lines and the border experience more fluid would be great for everyone. Thank you to the audience for attending. Thank you to Gustavo for being here with us. And if you'd like to continue seeing events like this, please support us on this Giving Tuesday today by going to give to, that's give to.ucsd.edu and type in border innovation in the search function. Your donation to the Border Innovation Challenge ensures that this program will return next year. Thank you again. I'm Alan. And good night.